going through the uh, book of Ephesians, and we're getting close to the end. How many of you know what Operation Neptune was? How many of you know what Operation Overload was? Well, how about Operation Royal Flush? How about Operation Sky? Those are all operations during World War II. Operation Overload was the overall plan of how they were then going to uh, take over and, and, and actually conquer the uh, German forces. Each one of the others was one of the small operations that they had to do to get to the Operation Overload the Total. Operation Neptune started June the 6th, 1944. That mission was to get a beachhead in Normandy. That was just one of the parts. So each one had a different uh, name and a different part. And the reason that's brought up is each one of us, how do we know how we fit into the book of Ephesians, how we fit into the overall plan? And what happens is I think we're oftentimes we're fighting the wrong war. Many of us are fighting the wrong war as Christians, and we need to realize who the real war should be fighting. Uh, if you remember, I think... Uh, uh, Watchman Nee had an interesting, the way he summarized the book of Ephesians was the first three chapters you're told to sit, and then chapter 4, 1 through chapter uh, 6, verse 9, you're told to walk, and then in verse 10, you're told to stand. And so think about it, on that part, the preparation for battle is sitting, that's our position in Christ. You remember Christ died on the cross for us in chapter 1, he seated at the right hand, you and I didn't believe. And we're sealed. And in chapter 2, it says we were seated along with him. Uh, if you go a little further, then it also tells you that you and I are united into one body. And then later in chapter 3, we have the purpose that you and I need to be doing as believers. And what we're supposed to be doing, we're, we're, you know, we do great things in through him and because of him, and we are bring glory to him. That's how chapter 3 ends. In chapter 4, if you think about the walk, that's our position. And if you think about it, we're supposed to be united in Christ as a body. We're supposed to be depending on Christ. Uh, we walk as wise men, redeeming the time. You remember, we're walking in the will of God. And that's, he then goes to what the wives are supposed to do, what the husbands are supposed to do, what the children are supposed to do, what the uh, employees are supposed to do, what the employer is supposed to do. He then gets to verse 10 of chapter 6, and he tells you to stand. And I think the reason this is because, you think about it, when Paul wrote this called the prison epistles, According to Acts 28, he was there for two years on the house arrest, and then also uh, and he's tied to the guard, chained to the guard for part of it. He got a pretty good look at what they wore and what their armor was. So then, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he's looking at what the Roman soldier wore, and he now is correlating that to, to what the believer is. It's also interesting, he told us, stand. In other words, when you're in battle, if you're told to stand, who's attacking? The enemy is. And so you think about it, Satan is going to be attacking us. And so we need to realize what position that we're in. And if you know much about Roman uh, weaponry, they had nothing for the back. Because a Roman was never supposed to run. <coughs> he was supposed to stand and face. You turn to the back and then you're exposing everything. So you and I are told. So just think about it. When we look at this, the walk, I think what happens, does my position match my practice? We've been talking about that for a long time. And also, does my practice seven days a week, or do I just practice one day a week? I've often heard people tell me when, when they're in business, doing business with them, and you're a Christian. Well, yeah, but business is business. No. If you're a Christian, it ought to affect every area of your life. Let's think about it. When I ask that question, are we fighting the right battle in verse 10 to verse 13? Is all we're going to do today. Verse 10, notice I want you to have, understanding your position in Christ. Notice this is finally be strong in the Lord. I want you to think about it. Be strong in the Lord. If you go to, uh, we won't have to look at it, but being strong in the Lord basically has to do with your faith. How many of us are strong in the Lord and how many of us are more of, and our strength is in the Lord, but how many of us are looking at our strength in ourselves? You are not going to fight against the, fight, the battles we have if you do it on your own. 
our strength is. So it has to be in the Lord. But what happens when you don't see? That's where your faith comes in. But again, that's what we're told to do. Notice he uses the word finally. He's coming to the end of the part. The choice to be strong in the Lord, again, and I said faith. If you want a definition of faith, I think the best one is Romans 4.21. Romans 4.21 is talking about Abraham and said he was being fully assured he was uh, he believed that God was able to perform what he had promised. Put anything you're facing, your name and what you're facing into that sentence and you'll see what it is. What did Abraham, he believed he was going to have a son when he was way, his wife way beyond the, the means to do so. So think about the faith. That's your choice. But notice the contrast. It says in the strength of his might. How many of us are doing it in our own strength? Earlier in this chapter, it talked about, and in chapter 1, it talked about his tremendous ability and strength. That's where we get the word dynamite talking about the Holy Spirit. Our power, we have the ability and the power that Christ had. He can grow us from the dead. But we're going the only way we're going to fight Satan is in his power, not in our own. But most of us are fighting wrong battles with the wrong means. And that's what we're doing. Most that's the choice. And notice you also have the charge that you have. So we need to walk, rely on Him in faith. We need to have the, His strength, not mine. But then notice in verse 11, the first part of it, put on the full armor of God. It's interesting, it's a choice. The action is an aorist tense, which means you put on your armor once and for all. Those of you that were in the military, and a lot of you were in, you know, were in um, Vietnam and other places, did you go to bed with your, with your gun? Or did you leave it out when you were in the foxhole or wherever you were? How many of you kept all that weaponry with you because you never knew what? When the enemy was going to come. That's why you have to have the armor on. It tells you to put it on once. <coughs> Satan doesn't come. Okay, I'm going to fire a missile at you. Get ready. Here it comes. Put your armor on. You know, that's when, you're gonna, that's when he's going to fire. Is when you don't have the right armor on. Are the right pieces. There's pieces inner armor that you're to wear, there's outer armor you're to wear, which we'll see next week. You also talk about going to the right and going to the left. It's also there. You and I have a choice to put on armor, but we're to put on which armor? You have to put on his armor. And how many of us are trying to find a spiritual battle with our human weaponry? And I think that's one of the biggest problems that we have as believers today. We're trying to fight a battle Either we're fighting the wrong battle or we're fighting it with the wrong weaponry. So look at the charge. The amount, notice it says put on the full armor. You have to have all of it. If we, had to, if we don't have a sword, what good is it? If we don't have a shield, what good is it? I mean, that'd be great to go up and fight when somebody doesn't have any weaponry to fight back or he is completely exposed if you're fighting. So we have that. So think about it. How many of us are trying to live the Christian life through our own sight and our own ability. If you are, you're going to be in Romans 7. What did Paul say? The things I don't want to do, I what? I do. And the things I do, I don't want to do. You will, that's the conclusion we're going to have if we don't put on the full armor of God and be in, walking in the Holy Spirit and realizing what He has done for us. So that's the first part, understanding your position. But what about understanding your opposition? Notice the, what he has. It tells you right there that you may be able to stand. If you don't have the armor on, you won't be able to stand. How many times when things happen do we get up overwhelmed and we run? And we have nothing. And that's what we're supposed to be standing against. It says against the schemes of the devil. The word schemes is the word where we get our word methods from. So think about some of the methods that he has. I'll just give you some of them. What about deception? According to 1 Timothy 2 and verse 4, it said he deceived Eve. You have it in John 8, he's the liar, the father of lies. So he will give us lies and things all the time. You can't do it. Just like Martha was saying earlier in her testimony, all the negativity, you can, Satan loves that kind of stuff. And he'll bring it. No, you can't do it. You can't do this. And to do that. So notice one is deception. In Genesis chapter 3, he also does the word doubt. When he was with Eve, he had three different ones there. But one of them was, did God really say this? Starts to bring doubt in your mind. As a, as a Christian, have you ever doubted? You know, 
Did Gideon, if God was really for us, why was this going on? Uh, that is very, very real, and Satan uses it a lot. Third one that you have is what about deny or distort God's word? In Genesis 3, he says, God said you are not to touch from any tree in the garden. Did God say that? No. He said they couldn't eat from one of them. He said nothing about touch. But it's amazing how he'll distort or he'll deny God's word. Even when he tempted Jesus in Matthew 4, he only quoted half the verse in Psalms, the one that fit his, but the part that didn't fit him, he didn't use. It's another one of his methods. He not only deceives, he doubts, he denies. According to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, he also discouraged them. He uses discouragement a great, great deal. Why do you want to get somebody off by themselves? Because discouragement will set in. Things aren't going or whatever, discouragement can really, really happen. Do you think Job got discouraged at all in the middle of it? What did all these people around him tell him? Curse God and what? You know, you're, you know, his friends obviously were telling him it was sin in his life and he doesn't know of any sin. Discouragement. Uh, another one, what about divisions? You think about divisions in James chapter 3, it even uses the word that he uses divisions. He uses divisions among believers too, doesn't he? If you get people to divide, that's one of the hardest things you had in World War II and why they selected Dwight Eisenhower to lead it. Because you had Montgomery on one side, a great general, and you had Patton on the other, and how well did those two guys like each other? They couldn't stand each other, and both of them thought they were the prima donna. And you had divisions. So here, the same thing happens that Satan uses. It's amazing how many times in the Christian church in America are we divided. And we divided against each other and consequently, Satan's loving it. He loves the division. We should be working together. Same thing with the vote or anything else we just had. It is not something to divide us. But Satan would love for it to divide us. Division is the fourth one. I think the, uh, the fifth one, the sixth one would be that of disillusionment. You get disillusioned. Was Job disillusioned to what was going on with the battle that he was facing? What about Gideon? You God, if you were really forced and really doing these things, why are we here? Disillusion. Um, God allows things in your life or he's trying to redirect and disillusion will grit it. He doesn't come to your aid the way you think he should or when he, you, he thinks you think he should and disillusion. And Satan is up there. You notice in Job 1 and Job 2, he has access to God every single day attacking you and I. So you think about it, if we know his methods, it helps. Whenever when I caught, uh, coached basketball, I mentioned it before, I was the only coach, that, only girls basketball coach. So I could never scout the opponent because every time I had a game, Tuesdays and Friday nights, the opponent had a game, Tuesday and Friday night. So I never got to ever see an opponent until all of a sudden game day. <coughs> Except for one time, our game was canceled. So I got to go across town, Holland Hall had a, a game, and we were playing them the next week. The one and only time I got to scout the opponent, but they had a better team than we did. But I got to see their best players and what their, their moves were. And their best player could only go to her right. And she always had to put the ball on the ground at least one time before she shot. So what do you think? The whole next week, what we think I was trying to tell the people, Number 25, you overplay her, stand completely over on her one side, and she has to dribble one time. I mean, they only scored 25 points. Now, we only scored 30, but 35, <laughs> and hey, we won the game. Because we did what? They knew the opponent, and they knew which players and what they were going to do. How well do we know Satan and his methods? So when disillusionment, discouragement come in, a lot of times, all we need is rest. Or you see somebody else, and they're now getting isolated. Satan's trying to pull them off by themselves to pick them off. Or we then come into their aid to bring them back in. So think about it. The methods that they have. What methods have, 
that they have. I think another one is, you think about it, what method has he tripped us upon? Doubting God's word, doubting his love, doubting different things. If scripture says it, even if I don't recognize it, I have to believe what scripture is saying. That's his methods. Notice the second part that he has on there. It says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. If you wanted to, you have the methods of Satan, now you also have the, you, if you wanted the minions of Satan. It's not blood. We are not fighting each other. And so often we're fighting the wrong battle. We're fighting each other. And if you think about it, he has there, the, it says in the last part, against rulers, against powers, against worlds of darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Those are words, and it's actually used positively in chapter 1. Christ has angels, two-thirds of them, according to Revelation 12, are with Christ, and one-third is with Satan. These are ranking words for rank. You even remember in the book of Daniel when they prayed and the one was bringing the answer and he's intercepted by the prince of Persia and then it says Michael came and freed him. We never think about we're asking, praying that the angel's coming to do this and one a demon intercepts and does all. We don't, we don't think that way, but that's what scripture says. We are in a spiritual battle. And so we have to realize what it is. So we cannot fight a spiritual battle with our human Thing. We have to rely on the Word of God. We have to rely on the Holy Spirit. Things that you and I don't see. And when the Scripture says that we have got to believe. So think about it. You have this. So we, just in uh, conclusion, our time's about up. Let me just ask you some questions. Do we understand and then apply our position in Christ? What is my position in Christ and do I apply it to my everyday life? Am I walking? It's amazing how many times in chapter 4 and chapter 5 you're told to walk. Another one, how many of us are trying to live the Christian life by our own sight and our own ability? We're told not to do this, we're told to do this, and try to do everything on our own strength. We try to witness on our own strength. What happens, and I'm sure all of you have taught, Brian, all of you that have taught and done anything, uh, men, women, doesn't matter. There'll be times when you'll come back and think, this is the greatest one, I already got this one nailed, and he goes in there and it's totally flat. No. And there'll be other times when you come home and you think, that was the worst I've ever done. And all of a sudden, two or three people come up to you and say, well, that meant so much to me. It really spoke to my heart. And you're thinking, man, then that's God doing it. But why we have to realize the Holy Spirit is the one who's opening people's heart. Give out the word you never really know. What about who are, are you battling? Are we, are we fighting the wrong one? We're, in our own mind, we're thinking of this person, that person, whatever it is. They're not who we should be fighting. That's why in Philippians 4, you remember the two ladies who were in the service, and Paul's in writing, and these two ladies need to come to harmony because of what the problems. They were, they were believers, but they were at odds and fighting within the church. And they're fighting against each other, and if you're doing that, then are you fighting against Satan and the enemy? You know, Satan loves it when you're fighting when we're fighting among ourselves because then we're not doing any damage to him we're doing damage to each other. Uh, are we battling with the right enemy with the right methods? You're not going to do anything against Satan with your own wit, intellect, and all the rest. He's a... That won't work. Do I recognize Satan's methods and actions? The doubt, the discouragement, the disillusionment, all those different things. He'll constantly be bringing it our way and when he does, remember Matthew 4, when Christ resisted, it said he left until what? Until another opportune moment. He will leave, and when he sees you like a lion, a roaring lion, a lion attacks who and when? The weak, the isolated, and so on. He doesn't attack a whole group. He'll attack, try to pick them off, recognize our enemy and his methods, and that way we can stand. But remember, it says to stand. We're going to look next week at what armor it is and what we should be wearing. And what we should be wearing. And what we should be wearing.